Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, so uh, for our update today, we have an additional 55 uh, test positive cases here in British Columbia, bringing our total up to 1,121 people who have tested positive for COVID-19 here. That includes 525 people in Vancouver Coastal Health, uh, 386 in Fraser Health, 72 on Vancouver Island, 121 in the interior health region and 17 now in the northern health region. Uh, in addition, we have an additional community outbreak uh, related to an inmate at the Okanagan Correctional Center uh, in the interior um, health region. And this is, of course, something that we have been concerned about and planning for. Uh, there was a number of measures put in place to try and reduce the risk of introduction of COVID-19 into all of our correctional facilities, both the provincial ones and the federal correctional facilities across the country. Um, there has been an active surveillance program and this is the first test that has been positive in a facility here in British Columbia. As people are probably aware, the Provincial Health Services Authority has taken over uh, the health uh, services for our correctional facilities across British Columbia a number of years ago, two or three years ago. So PHSA uh, Correctional Health and uh, Interior oh. Health have been actively managing this outbreak since we were notified uh, yesterday evening. In addition, we have uh, we continue to have uh, the 21 uh, long-term care or assisted living facility outbreaks that are actively being managed both in Fraser Health and in Vancouver Coastal Health. Currently, we have 149 people hospitalized with COVID-19 in British Columbia, and of those, 68 are in the ICU or critical care areas at this time. Sadly, we have had an additional six deaths uh, over the past 24 hours um, in British Columbia, bringing the total number of people who have died to, to 31 here. Um, that includes uh, two, uh, sorry, three additional um, deaths in, in Vancouver Coastal Health related to two of the long-term care facility outbreaks, uh, one in Fraser Health, and for the first time we've had uh, two people who have died here on Vancouver Island. Um, both of them um, uh, here in on Vancouver Island. So we uh, obviously put out our condolences again to the families, the care uh, providers and uh, the communities who will be missing these additional people. Uh, we have now um, on a positive note uh, 641 people who have fully recovered and are now out of isolation from COVID-19. So this has been, uh, you know, as I've said every day this week, it's a challenging time for us. It's a challenging time across the province. We're in that phase where we're, we need to be incredibly careful about what we're doing. We need to continue to take these, these actions that we've asked you to take and we've directed you to take over the last uh, three weeks. We now have more than a million cases of this disease worldwide. We know that there's a, a, a dramatic ongoing outbreak, ongoing outbreak in the United States and across um, Canada we're seeing increased numbers of cases, particularly um, in our communities in Toronto, uh, in Ontario and Quebec. We have now over 1,100 cases here in BC and it is growing. The number of people who are hospitalized is also growing. Um, although, thankfully, by a small amount. And that, I truly believe, is part of the reason um, that we are seeing the growth in a manageable way here in BC is because of what everybody is doing together. And that it remains the important thing around physical distancing that we can all do and allowing our, our public health services and our healthcare workers to focus on focus on the people in our, our long-term care homes, to focus on our hospital settings, to ensure that we can identify and rapidly respond to, to outbreaks in our communities um, to try and stop those tra transmission chains. Part of this, of course, is making sure with out exception that people who have come into BC from around the world are immediately complying with the orders, the federal quarantine orders and our provincial orders to self-isolate, to quarantine for 14 days. 
One of the things uh, that we do know is that uh, there will be some um, people from British Columbia who will be flown home from one of the, the additional cruise ships, the Zandam, that's uh, apparently going to be docking very soon in Florida. And we've um, been in contact with our counterparts at the federal government to ensure that they are appropriately assessed when they come back and that they are actively managed in quarantine. We know that these are such a high risk setting and that we have had um, people returning to British Columbia from other cruises uh, who have um, become, uh, have developed COVID-19. And we need to be very careful to support these people so that they are able to effectively isolate and that we have no transmission should anybody become ill. I also want to talk a little bit about some of the, the things that we've been asking people to do and requiring people to do in British Columbia around non-essential travel. And there are many of our smaller communities that are very concerned about people coming for, uh, to vacation homes, to fishing lodges, etc. And I am asking people now to uh, forego those types of travel. All non-essential travel, particularly to smaller communities where we might not have the resources to support you should you become ill or should there be transmission in those communities. And that's a really important thing that we need to do now to protect those who are more vulnerable in those communities, particularly our seniors and our elders in our small and remote communities around the province. In addition, we know that there's a, there's a very important time coming up for many people of different faiths. We have a, a number of religious celebrations coming up in the next uh, two weeks, including Easter, Passover, Ramadan. So there are many uh, faith-based celebrations that are happening. And I want people now to start thinking about uh, um, what we can do to support people in um, practicing their faith without having to have in-person gatherings. And I know many of the, the faith communities have been doing this already and have been um, particularly supporting elders and seniors in their community to make sure that they can safely participate virtually in many cases in, in religious, these important religious ceremonies. And there is no more important time than when a community is in crisis as we are in BC to, to make sure that we can do these types of important ceremonies in a safe way. So. We need to use the many tools that we have available now to connect with followers in other ways than in person. And we'll be um, talking again with our faith leaders next week um, to uh, make sure that we can all do this and share ideas about how to support each other in a safe way. We, we are getting through this and we will of course get through this together. And I am again very heartened by the fact that across this province people are taking the important actions that we are asking them to take and doing that in uh, support of each other in physical distancing and we are standing united in that in a virtual way. We're working together to keep that firewall strong to make sure that we can prevent the transmission of this disease as much as possible. We need to continue to follow these orders and precautions that we have in place. We must do all we can to protect our families and our communities across British Columbia. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, for our case update today, uh, we have uh, 53 uh, new uh, test positive cases in British Columbia, making our total number of cases who have tested positive in the province 1,174. That includes 541 who are in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 412 in the Fraser Health Region, 74 on Vancouver Island uh, Health Region, 126 in the Interior Health Region and 21 now in the Northern Health Region. Uh, in addition, we have one more additional long-term care home uh, outbreak to report today to bring our total of outbreaks in long-term care to, to 22. Um, that includes a total of, uh, of 176 of our cases and really reflects 
um, the, the, the difficulty that we have in, uh, in outbreaks in long-term care. I think, though, um, that we are heartened by the fact that the recent ones have been identified with a single staff person or a single resident has been uh, um, testing positive for the disease. And we know that uh, both in Vancouver Coastal and in Fraser Health, they have now very active outbreak teams for long-term care. And the measures that we've been putting in place in long-term care and assisted living means that these are being identified very early and we are able to control them. So the vast majority of the cases, unfortunately, are related to, to two of the earlier outbreaks at the Lynn Valley Care Centre and at Harrow Park. Um, the slightly positive good news today is uh, our hospitalizations uh, have gone down slightly to 146 people who are currently in hospital, and of those, 64 are currently in uh, the critical care units or ICU. Um, on the, the more sad note, we have had an increase in deaths once again um, with four more people who have succumbed to this disease. And again, related, three of them were um, related to the outbreaks at Harrow Park or Lynn Valley. And our condolences, of course, and our, our thoughts go out to the family members and the care providers for those people. We now have 641 people who have completely recovered from this disease. I wanted to talk a little bit to some of the uh, to the young people who may or may not be watching, um, but I thinking uh, I was talking with some of the, uh, of the youth in my life, and I recognize that this is a very challenging time for teenagers, in particular, to be stuck home with your families, maybe, um, to not have those social interactions that you're used to having with your friends at schools. Um, and the uncertainty about what's going to happen in the next few months, yeah, for particularly for those who are finishing high school, you know, the challenges about what's going to be happening, about university, about jobs in the future. And I know that can be very challenging for young people and very challenging for all of us to know how to deal with. And I just want to say, uh, you know, this is a transitional period in your life. And what is happening now is extraordinary. And you need to um, be comfortable in reaching out and find, find those trusted adults in your life. Don't be afraid to talk to them about what's going on, about your anxiety, about your concerns. And these are opportunities for us to work together with the young people in our life, to look up things, to find a trusted source of information, to try and, and put some normalcy, to put some, address some of the concerns that young people have. And I hope we, we can all stay connected in doing that, and we can do that in a way that supports them through this really difficult time. And you can tell by the numbers that we have, the people who are in hospital, the fact that this disease is being seen across our province, that the risk remains high for everyone here in British Columbia. We are in the middle of it. We're in the thick of things right now. And we see that with our, our colleagues in, in across the United States. We see what's happening in Ontario and Quebec and, uh, and our neighbours in Alberta. This is our time to hold the line. We must be unwavering in our commitment to keep our firewall up here in BC, to keep it strong and to flatten our curve. People have gone to extraordinary efforts and made sacrifices to protect their families, to protect our elders and seniors, to protect our health care workers and our health care system and our communities here in BC. And all of us must continue to do those basic things, to clean our hands regularly, to stay home if we can, as much as possible, to stay apart with our physical distancing, to have that safe distance between us and those, particularly our loved ones and our elders who might have severe disease if they get infected. To self-isolate if we are a traveler or if we're ill, to make sure that we're not passing this around to anybody else, and to stay connected in doing that to stay socially connected, to find those ways of reaching out to each other and supporting each other while maintaining that safe distance. I also want to talk to travellers who are coming back, and we know that there will be more um, Canadians coming back and people coming back to BC from other parts of the world where, where this disease is causing havoc in some cases. We must support them, and you must know that when you get back, uh, you need to immediately self-isolate for 14 days. That's how we protect our families, that's how we protect our communities. And that is without question and without exception. 
And if you have a loved one, a family member, or somebody in your community that is coming home, we need to do what we can to support them so that we're all in this together. We can drop off groceries, we can have frequent virtual visits, we can walk their dogs for them, we can share books and video games with them. We have to have a united focus for the next, for the next while. We need to, to toe this line together. We need to keep, us, keep our firewall strong in our communities across the province so that we can all be proud knowing that we have done the right thing and we are holding the line for our families and our communities. Thank you and good afternoon uh, for our today's update on the COVID-19 uh, situation here in British Columbia. I'm going to be talking about the two time periods, so uh, the 24 hours from Saturday to Sunday and then uh, April 5th to today. So um, from Saturday to Sunday, we had 26 new cases uh, test positive for COVID-19 here in British Columbia. And then for today, we have an additional 37. So that is 63 over the last two days to bring us up to 1,266 people in British Columbia who have tested positive for COVID-19. That includes 586 in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 450 in the Fraser Health Region, 79 on Vancouver Island, 128 in Interior Health, and 23 in the Northern Health Region. In addition, we now have uh, uh, 210 cases which are, who are associated with uh, long-term care or assisted living. All of them have been in the Fraser or Vancouver Coastal Health Region. So um, we now have uh, 21 active outbreaks in those regions, three of which, uh, three of the previous ones um, have been declared over, which means there have been no cases for two incubation periods. So that's good news around that. Um, currently in our case status, there are 140 people hospitalized across British Columbia right now and 72 of those um, are people in critical care in ICU or in the high acuity units. We've had one additional death um, in the last uh, two days and that is a, a, a community death in a known uh, COVID positive um, case, a man in his 40s and the coroner's service um, as with all un sudden unexpected deaths in the, in the community is investigating. We have had uh, 783 people who tested positive who have fully recovered. I do want to also say that uh, we've had uh, community outbreaks as you know um, in a couple of different situations and we've been advised of uh, another outbreak in a correctional facility, this time a federal correctional facility uh, in Mission where there's, uh, as I understand it, two positive uh, inmates in that facility and an ongoing investigation and outbreak response is, is actively um, activated there. This, as we've been saying, this is in the middle of our, our critical weeks here for COVID-19 and we must be steadfast in our commitment to holding the line right now in BC. We continue to see clusters and outbreaks in our communities and at facilities and these hotspots are very concerning. They can quickly escalate and challenge our response, our ability to keep things under control. Our percentage of new cases, as you can see, has been slowing, it's been bending and that's really important and it's testament to the effort that everybody here in British Columbia has been making over these past few weeks. But we must keep that firewall strong. My focus this week is to be supporting you all in making sure that we are keeping doing what we're doing that's making a difference. And you need to continue as well to focus on everything possible to break those chains of transmission in our communities across British Columbia. We've talked about uh, travelers coming home and it is important for us all to welcome them travelers home but make sure they have the means to join us in this and do their part by following the orders of self-isolation for 14 days after they come back here. We understand the many sacrifices that are being made across the province right now to ensure that we do our best and everything we can to protect our families, our communities, our healthcare workers and our healthcare system. 
I also know that it's been challenging for many people. And I want to really encourage us all to continue to be kind, to be kind with those who have to um, continue to work, whether it's in the grocery store, whether it's healthcare workers, um, people working in pharmacies. I know sometimes it's challenging when we've been going through um, this whole isolation and not having the usual contact and the usual things that we need to do. Um, I think it's important as well for us to, to recognize that we can have anxiety and the, the anxiety that is being expressed by our children, by our family members. I encourage people to talk to your physician if you have one. They can talk to you through um, virtual care. They can support you and particularly if you're somebody who has an underlying um, illness and needs to have that ongoing care. They are the best people who can support you in that. I also would recommend that people think about um, ways that we can support each other in reducing anxiety. And I know there's a couple of websites, for example, here in BC that are really helpful, um, including Anxiety Canada, where there's some really great information that you can think about how you're dealing with um, COVID-19 and also for, for young people and, and uh, people in your life to support them as well. The other one that I know is uh, Bounce Back BC, also a very helpful website to get resources to support yourself and your family. So we need to redouble our efforts. We need to keep this up. We need to continue to work um, to stay home and to do our part, but to support and care for those around us at a distance. And I'll say again, to, you know, this is our time to be kind and to be calm and to be safe. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, so this is our update on the COVID-19 situation here in British Columbia. Uh, for today, we have uh, 25 new uh, test positive cases here in BC for a total number of cases of 1,291. That includes 603 people in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 458 at the Fraser Health Region and the no change in the other three health regions, 79 on Vancouver Island, 128 people in Interior Health and 23 people in Northern Health. We also have no new long-term care outbreaks today. We remain with 21 and currently there are 213 people in long-term care who have uh, tested positive COVID-19. That's 132 residents and 81 staff people. Uh, right now, there are 138 people hospitalized with COVID-19 in, in British Columbia, and of those, 66 are in intensive care unit or critical care units. We have, um, sadly, another four people who have died from COVID-19 in the last day here in BC, three people in Vancouver Coastal Health and one in the Fraser Health Region. And 805 people have fully recovered and are no longer in isolation. So as we're all aware, there are a number of, of important religious celebrations that are coming up in the, in the coming weeks, starting tomorrow, really, and in the coming days. And many of us, mi millions around the world of many faiths, will be celebrating these major religious holidays. And we'll be celebrating in, um, collectively around the world in ways we've never done before in many cases. Our faith leaders, and we had a call with a, with a number of faith leaders from across BC again this morning, um, are also community leaders and people that we look to for guidance at these times when we're in crises, but also when uh, we have times of these religious celebrations. And I am so happy to see and have been so impressed by how much they have shown through their actions that we can still celebrate and care for those around us in virtual ways. And as a matter of fact, many more people during this time are finding ways to connect with people online through their religious faith, um, through many different religious faiths. And I encourage people to continue to look for those um, connections online. We've heard that many, many places have um, areas uh, uh, online that people can connect to. So I would encourage you to find those numbers. The followers and congregations around the province here in British Columbia, please, now is our time that we need to pay special attention to our elders and seniors. 
Our elders hold our history, our language, and our traditions, and are a precious part of our communities around this province. And through these celebrations over the coming weeks, please keep that in mind so that we can maintain our safe distance to protect them. We protect them by connecting safely from a distance. And that is an important thing for us all to remember. This is also a time, I know, when many people will be thinking of traveling and going to perhaps holiday homes or smaller communities around the province. And I'm really am imploring people, this is not our time to do that right now. We need to avoid all non-essential travel and it's important that we don't go to communities where we might not have the resources to support us if we become sick or if there's a medical emergency. So now is the time to stay home, to stay connected with our family, to stay connected virtually. I also want to say that you know, group celebrations inside are also problematic at this time. And while we have an order that uh, prohibits people gatherings of more than 50, right now, when we know that this virus continues to circulate in our communities, coming together of even small groups can be very problematic. And if you are uh, coming together as a small group, maintaining those distances, making sure you're doing the things we need you to do, like cleaning your hands regularly, making sure you're covering your cough, that if you are feeling at all unwell, that you do not go and do not um, bring this into an environment with others. I also want to say and today is, is World Health Day, which is a WHO um, day where we talk about awareness of health around the world. And I, I can't imagine more people being aware of health at this point in the world right now. But many people we know in British Columbia are managing chronic disease and other health issues. And I can encourage you to continue to work with your health care providers, to talk to your physician's office, your primary care provider's office, or if you don't have a primary care provider, to talk to our, the UPCCs uh, to call 811 if you need. We, we, it's okay for each of us to reach out and you can do it safely, you can do it online in many cases and there are many resources and options for care available for people online now through our community physicians, our family physicians our, um, and community organizations. I, I encourage you as well um, to connect with your family uh, physician, the people who know you best and know your condition best during this time. And if you do need urgent care, the emergency departments are there to support you. And 911 and our paramedic services are there to support you. So do not be afraid to, because of COVID-19 to call for help if you need it. Um, Finally, I just, you know, this is, uh, this is, as I've been saying in the last few days, a very, um, we're in the thick of it right now. Um, we continue, we need to continue to stay united and to stay strong. And as we look ahead to these celebrations with families and friends, let's keep our firewall strong. So this is our time to care and protect each other and our communities and our families across BC. I did want to add one other thing that, um, that has been brought to my attention and they say the, the number one thing not to do in a pandemic is your own hair and I will say believe them and uh, my apologies to Lindsay, my, my hairdresser, but I did do some of my own tinkering with my hair in the last couple of days. So yes, I did not go to the hairdressers and um, hopefully it will settle down soon. But <laughs> so. Uh, thank you and remind you all to, you know, this is a time for us to be kind and to be calm and to stay safe. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, for today's uh, BC update of COVID-19, we have uh, 45 new uh, cases uh, that tested positive, who tested positive in the last 24 hours here in BC, bringing our total to 1,336 people in the province who have a test positive. That includes 615 people in Vancouver Coastal Health, 487 in Fraser Health, 81 on Vancouver Island Health Authority area, 130 in the Interior Health area, and 23 in Northern Health. Um, we have no new uh, long-term care facility outbreaks. It remains at 21. 
Um, however, we do have some new cases, and we're up to 226 people in long-term care or assisted living who have tested positive, including 138 residents and 88 staff. Um, right now, we have 135 people who are hospitalized in British Columbia. That's a slight decrease in the last 24 hours. And 61 people in critical care or ICU. Um, and that as well is a decrease of five people in the last uh, 24 hours. Sadly, we, we continue to have um, deaths from COVID-19 in BC. And there were five uh, recorded in the last 24 hours, bringing us up to a total of 48 people who have passed away in, in British Columbia from COVID-19. And unfortunately, it continues to differentially affect um, our elders who are in long-term care, including uh, two people who died for the first two deaths in, in Amica Edgemont, one of the long-term care homes that has been experiencing one of, the, um, one of the outbreaks, and an additional person in the Lynn Valley Care Centre. and. Our hearts as well go out to those people, their families, uh, and the care teams in the long-term care homes who are doing uh, so much to try and protect and care for people. We, we now have 838 people who uh, meet their criteria for recovery and are no longer in isolation in British Columbia. A couple of things I wanted to bring up today quickly. You would have heard uh, at uh, 1.30 today that the Premier has announced that we are stepping up our partnership with our Canadian Border Service Agency and the Quarantine Service at, the, at our uh, land borders. And we will work together to support each other, to continue to uh, ensure that we can flatten uh, the curve of this outbreak here in British Columbia. And that includes making sure that we don't have gaps in our firewall. Um, and part of that is ensuring that people who come back from traveling overseas who have a risk of being exposed to COVID-19 because of those travels are able to join our, um, join our firewall to make sure that they have the means to do what they need to do to self-isolate for 14 days when they come back to best protect both themselves, their families, and our communities across BC. So the piece that we are adding, you would have heard today, is ensuring that everybody who comes back has, has an approved self-isolation plan that they attest to and that they sign off on, and that we are there to support and welcome them and make sure they have the means and the things that they need to be able to adhere to this self-isolation plan. And that may mean for some people that they spend some time in our uh, in a, a quarantine facility that we'll be partnering with the federal government on and tell the, the important pieces that they need are in place to be able to self-isolate effectively at home. For many people, for most people, I'm sure, it will mean that they go directly home and that we're able to support them by providing things like groceries, medications if needed, and other things to make sure that they are able to effectively and safely care for themselves and to self-isolate in their community. We also are going to be doing regular check-ins on everybody who is in self-isolation to make sure they have the things that they need to continue to follow the measures that we need them to take and that they are able to be connected quickly to health services if those are needed and they know who to contact should they have um, needs arise while they're in self-isolation. And I want to thank um, particularly the many community organizations and public servants across British Columbia who stepped up to be part of this initiative. It's a really important thing that we can do to welcome home our fellow people from British Columbia and make sure that they have the means to, to stand with us and make sure we're doing all that we can to continue um, to prevent transmission of this virus in our communities. I will um, also mention as we're coming up to the long weekend that you know we've said this before and we'll say it again we need to we need to stay home t this weekend we need to be close to our families to the people that we uh, we share our homes with and we need to reach out to others virtually and stay connected but this is not the time to to take unnecessary travel it's not the time to go to some of our smaller or more remote communities where the services may not be available to support you or to support the community should this um, virus be introduced into those communities. And we need to make sure that we consider the impact that such a misstep could have on everything that we have done and everything that we have put together in the last couple of weeks and to make sure that we continue to keep our firewall strong. 
So we are in this together, and I said this week every day, we are in the thick of it right now. We are still watching what's happening across the country and across the globe, and it is no time for us to let up at all. And I want to thank everybody for who's doing their part and others who may find this challenging. But this is the time where we can be together to support each other in being able to do what we need to do right now. And that's all about safe distancing between us, not connecting with people physically, but connecting with them virtually, making sure we're supporting each other, making sure we're doing the cleaning our hands regularly, covering our mouth, and staying away from others, particularly if we're not feeling well ourselves. So every day that we are doing this is making a difference. It's making a difference in our communities across British Columbia. And this is our time to continue that, to care for each other, to bend the curve together. And as the Minister said yesterday, bend the curve, not the rules this weekend. And, I'll, and uh, it's, it's a time to continue what we have been doing, being kind to each other, being calm, and being safe. Thank you very much. And I will start by uh, acknowledging that we are on the traditional territories of the Lekongan-speaking people, the, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, and we're very grateful for the keepers of this land. Um, for our COVID-19 case update today, we have 34 new uh, case uh, test positive cases here in British Columbia, bringing our total to 1,370. That includes uh, 626 people in Vancouver Coastal Health, 508 in Fraser Health Authority, 82 on Vancouver Island Health Authority, 130 in Interior Health, and 24 in the Northern Health Authority. Um, right now, in terms of our case status, we have 132 people who are in hospital around the province, and of those, 68 are in critical care or ICU. Uh, we have, uh, unfortunately, two more people who have succumbed to COVID-19, bringing the total number of people who have died to, to 50 in British Columbia. And uh, that is one person in Vancouver Coastal and one in, in Fraser Health in the past 24 hours. Um, 858 people have fully recovered from uh, COVID-19. I do want to talk uh, for a few minutes about long-term care. We have no new facility outbreaks, and indeed we have a, an, an additional uh, long-term care facility where the outbreak has been declared over. Um, that's really good news. Um, the 20 remaining facilities, however, continue to have active cases, and we have 235 in total um, cases that are associated with long-term care and assisted living, including 143 residents and 92 staff. And as you know, the vast majority of the people who have died are uh, seniors and residents of long-term care. We recognize that uh, residents of long-term care um, really and assisted living um, are very vulnerable to COVID-19. And the most important um, area that we do and uh, what we are trying to do is um, make sure that the workers who provide the care and the service to people in long-term care are able to work at a single facility. This is something that we have recognized uh, in public health from the very beginning of this outbreak and indeed recognized it from outbreaks that we have every year, whether it's influenza or gastrointestinal outbreaks or even antimicrobial resistance outbreaks. The challenge that we have uh, with care providers um, needing and healthcare workers of all kinds needing to, to work at multiple different facilities makes it such a challenge um, to try and control outbreaks, and that has been um, brought to the forefront during this pandemic in, in many ways. And it's, uh, it, it is a part of the tragedy that we're dealing with with the multiple long-term care facility outbreaks. And we have mentioned before, but as of today, it's official, we have been using orders under both the Public Health Act that I've given and under the Emergency Programs Act to implement a process to make um, it possible for care workers, health care workers of all kinds to work at a single site only and to be able to do that in a way that's uh, effective and able to give support to staff who are continuously um, continuing to respond courageously to the monumental challenges that we're facing and to do their very best and the very best we can do to protect our elders and seniors in long-term care and assisted living. 
and they have our tremendous respect and support during this pandemic. This is, uh, as, as we have said all along, you know, we are taking a cross-government, um, all province, and every single one of us in this province um, are responding to, to try and, and stop COVID-19 from affecting our communities and our families. And this involves ensuring our healthcare system is robust and ready, and we've done many things around that. Um, this is another step in long-term care that we know will make a difference. Taking care of our frontline healthcare workers so they can care for us is another important piece. Protecting and providing support to our most vulnerable, whether it's people with disabilities, um, people who are living on the streets, people who are um, uh, in long-term care, our older citizens, uh, our seniors and elders, people in um, remote communities and in other facilities. Doing all we can as individuals across this province to keep our firewall strong. And I do want to recognize that it's so many people across BC are doing their part and it is making a difference. The single site order that we just talked about makes our health system stronger and is, in my mind, vital to preventing further transmission and protecting our elders and seniors. I also want to recognize the early childhood ed educators, the K-12 teachers and the educational assistants who have really stepped up around the province and are in classrooms and daycares to support our healthcare workers and other essential workers, but particularly to support our healthcare workers and our most vulnerable children, the children who are most at risk of falling behind because of this pandemic. So thank you to them. Those kids would otherwise face setbacks that they may um, may have difficult challenges for the rest of their lives and the work that you're doing is incredibly important. So thank you for that. As I've been saying all week, we are not over the hump yet and we are going to have a bumpy ride for a while. We're holding our own and we're keeping it down, but we all need to continue to do this. And when we're going into this long weekend, it's more important than ever that we keep going, that everything we are doing now, we keep up. And I know this is a challenging time for many, um, for many of us, both physically, emotionally, mentally, and it's hard, especially when those connections that we so need, those meaningful connections, are mostly virtual connections. And that is something that we, uh, many of us have a hard time getting used to. There are many resources that we're making available more and more to you, and as announced today by Minister Judy Darcy, more is on the way. If you are struggling and you need extra help, please reach out. We talked earlier this week about um, the, there's a number of websites. You can reach out to your primary care physicians. You can go to Anxiety Canada, Bounce Back BC, and there is more um, resources that were announced just this morning uh, by Minister Darcy. So this is a, a long weekend for many. It's a week weekend as well when there's many religious and uh, faith-based um, things going on. And what I really want to say is, you know, let's make this a weekend to unwind, but to be kind. It's a weekend for us to stay at home and to appreciate what we have. Now is not the time for travel unless it's absolutely necessary and you need to take care of your family. There's lots that we can do close to home with our family, with the people we live with, with our close circle of friends. Have fun, but be safe. Reach out to your elderly neighbour, offer to tidy their garden, drop off food, host your own cooking show online, um, stream a movie with a friend. There are so many things that we are starting to do now to stay connected. We can have a virtual block party at 7 o'clock. I know in my um, neighbourhood we do that. Sit in the sun and read a book. It's supposed to be nice this weekend, but stay close. It's also okay to go for a bike ride or go for a walk in the sun but keep your distance. Let's wave hello to our friends and neighbours, wave hello to those that we pass, but from a safe distance. We all need kindness and we all need connection. So let's do that safely and do that at home this weekend and to continue the mantra to be kind and to be calm and to be safe. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Bonnie Henry, the Provincial Health Officer, and I'm uh, very grateful to be here uh, today on the 
traditional and unceded territories of the Lekongan-speaking peoples, particularly the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations. And uh, I'm here to give you the update on where we are with COVID-19 here in British Columbia. We have another 35 new uh, COVID-19 positive cases in British Columbia today, bringing our total to 1,445 people. That includes 642 people in the Vancouver coastal area, 558 in the Fraser Health area, 800, uh, sorry, 84 on Vancouver Island uh, Health Region, 135 in the Interior Health Region, and 26 in the Northern Health area. We have no new long-term care facility outbreaks. Um, there are t continue to be 20 with active cases and we are up to 246 cases in long-term care or assisted living, including 153 residents and 93 staff. And unfortunately, we have an additional three deaths, um, bringing our total to 58 people who've lost their lives uh, to COVID-19. And as always, our, our thoughts are with their families, their caregivers, and all of us who are affected, not only by people who have died from COVID-19, but um, those who have died during a time when it's been a very much a challenge to come together and celebrate people's lives as we've had in the past. We also have a, an outbreak, as uh, we reported uh, a week or so ago, um, at a federal correctional facility in Mission. And we have been uh, working very closely with our federal counterparts to ensure that they have everything they need to manage that outbreak. There are a number of both inmates and staff who've been affected and the, the total positive cases are up to 26 from that facility. Um, those are included in the numbers that we report for British Columbia. And uh, as of yesterday, there were five um, people from the mission uh, facility hospitalized in BC. We continue to work very closely, particularly Fraser Health and the BC CDC, um, in supporting our corrections partners in managing the uh, challenging outbreak in that facility. Currently, we have 134 people hospitalized uh, for COVID-19 in British Columbia, and of those, 63 are in critical care or in ICU. We also have 905 people now who have fully recovered from COVID-19. On this uh, long weekend, we have given, um, been providing messages about the need for us all to stay home. This is not a time to be going traveling, even if it's to a summer home or a cottage. We hope that everybody is off enjoying their weekend, spending time with their with their close family, with their households, and uh, in taking the time to unwind and to be kind to each other. I sincerely hope that most people have avoided any unnecessary travel. All across the province, we know the, these physical distancing measures are in place, and we know they are so important to be able to continue um, the trend that we are having in managing this pandemic. So I want to say thank you for staying home and avoiding putting unnecessary strain on, on our small communities around the province. And we want to make sure that we're not taking services and support away from those who live locally and need it. It's so important to keep going with everything that we are doing right now. The other thing I want to report on is that we have implemented our new uh, returning traveler protocols at the um, international borders in British Columbia as of yesterday. So the requirement for an approved self-isolation plan um, is in place for all returning travelers. Um, that's more, um, this is more about how we can support um, our fellow British Columbians and Canadians returning from other parts of the world right now and making sure that they join us in our response um, to managing this pandemic and keeping our families and our communities safe here in British Columbia. I want to say thank you as well to the many volunteers who are helping to make this happen and who have been active and out there at our border crossings in the past couple of days. And also to our federal partners and the Canadian Border Service Agency, the Quarantine Service, we're all working on this together to do the best that we can to make sure we're protecting our communities and our families here in BC. So this is a long weekend. It's a weekend 
uh, where there are many reflections and religious ceremonies that are happening over this weekend. And I encourage you all to take that time to connect to people, to connect to your family, your community in virtual ways and keep the physical distance between us. Let's show that kindness and care to each other by staying home and being safe. And let's all of us take this time to be kind, to be calm, and to be safe. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, today's update uh, covers the, the last two days uh, here in uh, British Columbia. So uh, two time periods between April 11th and 12th, and then between April 12th to today. So we have a, um, sorry, I have to <laughs> read my notes here. So between uh, April 11th and 12th, we had 25 new uh, people test positive for COVID-19 in BC. And then in the past 24 hours, we've had 20 new cases, bringing us to 45 new cases since our last briefing on Saturday. The total in British Columbia uh, has is now 1,490 people who have tested positive for COVID-19 in our province. That includes 650 in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 591 people in the Fraser Health Region, 87 people here on Vancouver Island, 136 in the Interior Health Region, and 26 in the Northern Health Region. Uh, we have no new long-term care facility outbreaks. Um, they, that remains at 20, uh, mostly 11 in Fraser Health and 9 in Vancouver Coastal Health. We have had a number of new cases in those long-term care facilities, bringing our total to 254 people um, associated with long-term care facilities who have tested positive, including 159 residents and 97 staff people. In addition, we have a number of community outbreaks, as you're aware of. Primarily uh, the, in the interior, we have the um, outbreak related to temporary foreign workers and a nursery. There's been one additional positive case in that outbreak, bringing the number of people who have tested positive to 20. The ongoing uh, quarantine and isolation of uh, all of the people in that community and that the um, interior health is working very closely with the owners and the property owners to make sure everybody is cared for and that they're able to self-isolate or quarantine effectively. In addition, we've had, uh, as you're aware, one case identified at the Okanagan Correctional Centre. Um, that outbreak remains uh, under observation. As we know, there is a 14-day incubation period, so there is ongoing testing and surveillance being done at the Okanagan Correctional fac Facility. But to date, uh, only one person has tested positive, and there have been a number of negative tests in that uh, outbreak response. The other large outbreak response that we are dealing with, we talked a little bit about on Saturday at the Mission Federal Correctional Institute in, uh, in the Fraser Valley. Uh, the outbreak continues uh, to grow at that facility. We now have 35 people in the facility who have tested positive, including eight who are now in hospital in the Fraser Health area. So uh, this is, of course, of great concern to us, and we've been working very closely with Fraser Health, um, with Correctional, uh, Correctional Services Canada, and with the BCCDC to support the ongoing outbreak investigation, as well as the infection prevention and control measures that are needed within that facility. And our priority, of course, is to protect all of those who are in the facility, but ensure that um, British Columbians are protected as well and that our community is able to um, respond and support um, people who are working in the facility as well as the inmates in the facility and our hospital system. We are working very hard to ensure that the transmission within that facility will be contained. Um, unfortunately, as we talked about on Saturday, this, uh, there was quite a lot of transmission that happened before the outbreak was recognized, and we are now seeing people who were exposed over the previous two weeks developing symptoms. And there's ongoing testing and surveillance that continues in that facility. In terms of our cases here in BC, we have 137 people who are hospitalized, and of those, 58 are in critical care or ICU here in, in British Columbia. 
Unfortunately, in the last two days, we've also seen a number of deaths increase. Um, we've had a, a total of 11 new deaths um, to bring our total of, of people who have died from COVID-19 in BC to 69. The majority of those uh, continue to be in long-term care and our hearts go out to the families and the caregivers of the people who have passed away over the last the last few months and the challenges that we know are facing the families um, across British Columbia. We have 905 people who have recovered fully from this disease in BC. One of the key things that uh, we have implemented in British Columbia to ensure that we have ongoing protection of our communities and our families as we welcome our fellow British Columbians home from where they might be around the world is our requirement for a, a approved self-isolation plans for all returning travelers. This came into effect on Friday, April 10th. And I'm really pleased with the initiative and I, my uh, thanks go out to the many people who are involved with supporting this. The success of this initiative is really to provide the necessary supports that enable our fellow BC British Columbians who are returning to self-isolate effectively, to make sure that they have what they need so that we can support them and they join us in making sure we're doing everything we can to stop transmission of this virus. So since April 10th, 1,701 people have returned from around the world to British Columbia. That includes either by vehicle or by air. And we have uh, the support systems in place and have been fully activated. 13 travelers have uh, required accommodation um, because they weren't able to immediately fulfill their, their self-isolation plan. And 207 people have been contacted to ensure that they have what they need in follow-up. So thank you to our many partners, the many um, public servants here in BC who stepped up to be part of this initiative and our partners with uh, the Quarantine Service and the Canadian Border Services Agency. This is an important ongoing initiative to ensure that we're doing everything we can to keep our communities and families safe here in BC. I also want to talk a little bit about personal protective equipment. As you know, this has been uh, um, something we have been consumed with in the last uh, few months to make sure that we have what we need. We continue to actively source and receive supplies of PPE for all of our healthcare workers. And we want to thank you um, particularly to our neighbors in Alberta for uh, their additional supply that they provided to British Columbia over the last uh, few days. That's fabulous. We have enough PPE to meet our current demand, but we are not out of the clear yet. Many of you have also made very generous donations, and we want to thank you for that. And, uh, but to remind people that the best way for you to donate or to offer your services and products is through uh, the Supply Hub that has been established, and you can go to Supply Hub. And uh, that is an important thing for us because we have a team of people who are able to um, make sure that anything that is donated meets the specifications that we need, particularly the medical specifications. Even um, N95 respirators are not all created equal. They are made for many different things, and some of them that are used in industrial settings may not be appropriate for the medical setting. So through the supply hub, we can make sure that these are all tested and they meet the, the specific uh, specifications that we need to be used in the healthcare system. But we want to thank everybody for their ongoing efforts and contributions in this area. Finally, uh, around weekend travel, we have asked British Columbians to avoid non-essential travel. And we have received many questions uh, about BC ferries and about other travel options. I th think it's safe to say that we have been united in keeping our firewall strong across this province and BC Ferries continues to report more than 80% decline on travelers on all of their routes. So that is something that reassures us. But I do want to say there are many reasons why people may need to travel. And essential travel is still required to keep our province going, to make sure that we have the food, the medications, the things that we need in all parts of the province. Goods and the people to deliver our services still need to move. Many students as well are now returning home as the, uh, the semesters have ended for our universities and that is an important thing for them. 
I also know many people live and work in more than one location, and that means at the start and the end of th their week, they may need to be on the road. But I thank you all for doing um, what you can to limit your need for travel. And everybody whose efforts to stay home and stay safe and keep a safe distance from others over this weekend. So today, today actually marks our 50th public update since this crisis began. And it's a key part of how we are trying to keep you informed and make sure that you know everything that we are doing and that uh, we all have the information that we need to take the actions to protect our families and our communities. And Minister Dix and I remain committed to maintaining these updates for as long as they are needed. It is so important for all of us to keep going with everything that we are doing now. It is holding us, it is holding our line, it is allowing us to deal with these issues in a way that is uh, the best that we can do for our province. We need, we'll keep going with our updates and with our 24-7 provincial response on this issue for as long as we need to do that. And I'm asking you as well to please keep on the line, hold that line, keep doing what you are doing. And especially for our, our youth and, and our young people and our children, Remind, remember, this is not forever, but it is for now. And what you're doing is making a difference. So thank you for doing your part with kindness and with care. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, for today's uh, BC COVID-19 update, um, I will report that we have 27 uh, new cases uh, who have tested positive in the province in the last 24 hours, bringing our total to 1,517. That includes 500 and, uh, sorry, 658 in Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 601 in the Fraser Health Region, 89 on Vancouver Island Health Region, 141 people in Interior Health and 28 people in the Northern Health Region. We have in addition uh, one additional long-term care facility outbreak reported um, in Vancouver Coastal Health in the South Granville Park Lodge. And uh, as always, the list of the long-term care facility outbreaks will be included um, with the statement release. We have 20 other long-term care or assisted living facilities with ongoing active outbreaks, um, including uh, 289 cases so far, 165 residents, and 124 staff. Uh, in addition, we have uh, three additional uh, positive cases at the nursery facility in the interior health where we've had a, an ongoing outbreak and monitoring um, that interior health is doing with that, um, with that premise where we've had a number of temporary foreign workers who've tested positive. The, uh, the facility outbreak at the Okanagan Correction Center, Correctional Center remains at a single positive case so far, but there's ongoing outbreak measures at that facility. And as we've talked about over the last few days, we have an ongoing and concerning outbreak at the Mission Medium Security Correctional Facility in, uh, in the Lower Mainland. There are, um, as of official reports, there are 41 test positive cases. We know there's ongoing testing and cases pending, and we currently have seven people from that uh, facility who are in hospital uh, in BC. Um, in response to that, we've had an ongoing effort over this weekend to beef up the outbreak response, the infection prevention and control measures, and the investigation of the outbreak and management of the outbreak between the province, um, Fraser Health Authority in particular, and uh, Correctional Services Canada. Um, and as part of that, uh, the hospital, um, Abbotsford Regional Hospital, has um, de de developed a, a dedicated unit to ensure that people can be safely and securely cared for, if need be, in hospital. And in addition, um, Fraser Health is looking at redeploying the mobile medical unit that we have in the province that is able to look after um, people in a, a hospital setting and include critical care, if need be. 
from the, this uh, mobile medical unit has been set up at the Vancouver Convention Center, um, but it will be redeployed um, to the Ab Abbotsford area to provide additional support for this ongoing and very concerning outbreak that we have at the Mission Correctional Facility. Um, in addition, right now we have 134 people in British Columbia who are hospitalized, and of those, 58 are in critical care ICU. We have an additional three deaths to report today, um, bringing our total of people who have died from COVID-19 in BC to 72. All three of these uh, were deaths that are occurred in our long-term care homes, uh, two in Vancouver Coastal and one in Fraser Health. And our condolences and our thoughts and prayers go out to the families and the care providers for these people um, who have um, been affected by this virus. We have 942 people who have recovered fully in BC now. I want to talk a little bit about the pandemic response and want to thank a number of people who have been um, really actively engaged in helping us build our firewall that we will need to continue for some time to come here in British Columbia. First to the mobile medical unit that I mentioned, who the team is going where the need is greatest at the moment and we appreciate their flexibility and their expertise in being able to support our response. In addition, I really want to thank the many public servants at our land and air borders, people from the public service in British Columbia who recognized that, that we need a need and stepped up to a call for volunteers. And they're supporting travelers who are coming back to BC to self-isolate. They're assessing their self-isolation plans and ensuring that this is done safely so that everybody can meet what we need them to do, our expectation that they self-isolate for 14 days. We are in this together, and this is our way of supporting other British Columbians who are coming back home. And we need this for now, and we need this for our future, because this is going to be an important piece that we do um, going forward to make sure that w if and when we're at the point where we can reduce some restrictions here in British Columbia, we're not reseeding or adding more sparks um, to our province uh, in people coming from around the world. And so we expect that this border control effort will be going on for some time. And we were happy to hear that the federal government has now um, uh, put in place an order in council that extends these same types of, of supports and uh, requirements for self-isolation plans to all of the borders in Canada as we feel that that is an important way for us to protect ourselves um, going forward from this virus. And just to give you a sense of the numbers, there were over there are 2,337 uh, 2, arrivals um, over the last few days since this was put in place in British Columbia and 24 people have been uh, offered accommodations. Everybody else has been supported to self-isolate. So that, I think, is a big success story and an important part of our firewall for the future. Today, as well, I want to recall and talk about the fact that COVID-19 is not our only public health emergency in BC right now. Four years ago today, we declared a public health emergency because of the overdose crisis, that it was affecting our communities, again, around this province, affecting our families, our brothers and sisters, our uncles, our friends. And this crisis also continues. It, I am acutely aware and continue to be acutely aware of the suffering and loss that is being felt by people who use drugs, by their families and by their communities. Many have lost loved ones, in particular the challenge of, uh, that people have around stigma and around the concern about um, accessing help and getting the help that they need. I want you to know that you are not alone, that we are not slowing down our response or taking our focus off the importance of being able to support people who use drugs and their families and our communities. We're not letting this crisis overtake the importance of our response to our uh, overdose crises here and the work that we need to do to continue to support people who use drugs we have teams that have come together to address these two emergencies and dedicated to providing support to people who are at risk of both of these crises. 
We are working diligently. There have been a number of movements already, and you've heard from Minister Darcy around this, around emergency housing options, and we are continuing to work on making sure that people who need those housing options are able to access them in the coming days. And so people who are experiencing homelessness and other issues, mental health crises, along with um, along with their uh, concerns around substance use, are able to get the support they need to effectively isolate, but also to care for their um, their needs, their access to overdose prevention sites, the appropriate access to supervised consumption services, and some of these have had to be modified and changed, and that is a challenging thing. We've also um, increased and expanded our ability to provide people with pharmaceutical alternatives to what we know is an incredibly and increasingly toxic street drug supply. We also know that many of the more um, invulnerable people in this community are challenged now for even accessing the basics such as food. And there are many things that we're putting in place to support you and to continue to support you through these two crises. We want all of those who are living with substance use and addiction and other major health issues to know that you are not forgotten and we are continuing to make sure that we have those safety nets in place for you. What you are doing today and what all of us in BC are doing is making a difference and it matters. And there have been incredible sacrifices and we're not um, we are very much aware of that. But your efforts and the efforts of everybody in British Columbia to keep our communities and our families safe and to contribute has made a difference in our collective well-being. So as these crises continue, I want to remind people to take care of yourself and to take care of those around you. Everyone, we all have a stake in this. And we, um, we need to continue to look after ourselves and to look after our communities and to remind you to be kind to each other in doing this, to be calm and to stay safe.